Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 10 of Cycling Research Review. Today's paper is by the author Ben Hamilton Bailey, titled Urban Design, Why Don't We Do It on the Road? Modifying Traffic Behavior Through Legible Urban Design. So this paper really tries to take us to the urban design realm and is written for traffic engineers. And it teaches traffic engineers uh, some ideas that might help them reconceptualize A, what uh, road space is for, and B, how the urban design world can give lessons to uh, the world of traffic engineering. He starts off by painting a picture, uh, and it is a picture of stepping off uh, the train in Bath. He says, quote, step off the bus or the train on arrival to any town or city. The backdrop to your first impression will be determined by the history, the landscape, and topography, and architecture of the place. Buildings and their interrelationships will be inspiring or depressing, depending on the creative efforts of man and nature. We know we are in Bath, Baltimore, or Berlin by a unique, complex mixture of natural and artificial landmarks and symbols that provide the data for our mental maps and our memories. Yet the foreground to our experience of cities is very different. It is likely to have been fashioned neither by natural processes nor by the peculiarities and idiosyncrasies of architecture or the design professions. The immediate close-up environment of almost all of our cities is determined by curbs, asphalt, road markings, bollards, traffic signals, barriers, and signs. We will negotiate our journey into and through the city amidst the landscape fashioned by traffic engineering. The rules that govern this landscape have little in common with the special culture, history, and values that have shaped architecture and the unique signature of place. So this quote brings up how uh, urban design has a relationship to a, both our psychology of how we perceive a place and also to uh, the landscape and the environment. So whereas urban design, he argues, works with the environment to create something unique, traffic engineering is more about creating uniformity so that uh, people who are driving at higher speeds don't have to exert too much mental energy in order to negotiate a place, right? Think of a, a highway near you. Uh, it is a place that's almost completely uh, carved through nature uh, in an effort to make sure that uh, the traffic that goes through doesn't have to make tight turns or uh, drivers are uh, free from making any immediate decisions that, that might be dangerous. So big signs, uh, big lane marking, everything's very clear. But the expense of this is we lose the sense of uniqueness to a place. And the other expense of this is that we uh, have cities full of signs, markings, and these uniform infrastructure that perhaps detract from what he calls the, the background of a city. So imagine yourself coming out of a train station and you're suddenly greeted by a five-lane road instead of having the vista and the view uh, for you to immediately see the city. You know, we have come to accept this as the price of uh, efficiency, modernism, whatever you call it. Uh, but this paper makes an argument that at least within urban areas and within our cities, that uh, the ideals of placemaking, that having a place's unique signature is much more important than uh, getting traffic to move through. So he notes um, from the urban design uh, point of view that there's very little traffic engineering that's actually taught uh, in that school. So anything related to traffic, it's completely ignored. But it's uh, peculiar because, uh, as he mentioned, in places like Detroit, New York, um, traffic actually takes up most of the urban space. So there's much more road than there are sidewalk. And the sidewalk is a domain of urban designers, whereas the road is a domain of traffic engineers. He notes, the well-stocked library of Harvard's Graduate School of Design, one of the leading in the world, for example, contained little reference to traffic engineering. And there appears to be no comprehensive history of the subject. The distance between traffic engineering and urban design seems to be reflected in universities everywhere, and the disciplines appear to have entirely disconnected sources and starting points. 
So it's really odd that something that's so close physically in our environment, uh, if you're on one side of the curb, it's urban design. If you're on the other side of the curb, it's traffic. Something that, that really is really dem demarcated by something simple as a curb uh, have very few intellectual roots together. We expect people to work together, you know, to build a city, but uh, because these disciplines are so far apart, you know, uh, they don't have a shared language, they don't have shared models of how things work. For example, traffic engineering is heavy in mathematics. Urban design is more uh, heavy on uh, the creative side, so much more in common with architecture. And if they don't have the same language, you throw these professions together in a municipal government office or an urban planning department, and you expect these people to work together. So uh, perhaps there's room in there on the education side uh, to bring these disciplines close together. Furthermore, it is important to think about where cycling fits into this. Is it more, which side of the curb is it on, uh, if we continue this metaphor? Is it on the sidewalk side? Is it on the uh, traffic road side? And I think depending on that, then that's also a, a place to start this conversation. It could really be a place where we bring urban designers and traffic engineers together and say, hey, uh, your models uh, about how the world works is not sufficient. That uh, in fact, for some types of vehicles and some environments, we require both sets of expertise. And uh, it, I see it as an opportunity to bring these realms together. So he, uh, he goes on to say, uh, to comment on how this idea of separation, traffic separation and traffic integration have, has evolved over time and where it came from. One of the sources is Buchanan's uh, Traffic in Towns report written for the, the British government about uh, some ideas to move forward in the 1963. This is when traffic became a real issue um, in, in Great Britain. And, uh, and that's when they realized that traffic was clogging up cities. And I quote, guiding planners and traffic engineers to segregate roads designed for the movement of vehicles from spaces where pedestrian activities, children's play, and public events would take place. The pedestrian precinct was born where the architecture and the urban form of a city could be isolated from traffic movements. And he goes on to contrast this to how uh, in modern Dutch concepts, uh, where, for example, the Vonef, where the, uh, the traffic is calmed down to make room for children playing, to make room for social activities on the same street where cars are. And, uh, and here we see, well, what is a street? If we take out the curb, which is what he's suggesting, if we take out the curb and create a shared space, um, who controls this domain? What kind of logic should it follow? Uh, and uh, do we need signs at all to make it work? So he illustrates in this diagram the difference between uh, traffic space and uh, the social space, which he uh, demarcates on the traffic zone as single, uniform, regulated, impersonal, predictable, and on the social side, multifunctional, diverse, culturally defined, personal, and unpredictable. My question to you is, where does cycling space fit in? Is it a social zone activity or is it a traffic zone activity? He states, the contrast between the characteristics of these two worlds are striking. The traffic zone, such as a freeway, serves a single purpose. It is highly regulated by the state through rules, regulations, examination, and legal enforcement. It is subject to systems analysis and, in theory, predictable. It is impersonal and uniform. By contrast, the qualities that we most associate with the rich and varied public realm are exactly the opposite. Cities accommodate a multitude of simultaneous functions. They are highly diverse, uh, personal, and are governed by a complex web of ever-evolving social and cultural conventions. Cities are unpredictable, and rich ur urban environments offer surprise, serendipity, and ambiguity. What do you want in a cycling journey? Which side do you want it to fall on? He goes on to then highlight the elements of human physiology and psychology that uh, comes into play when we're designing uh, social spaces. He notes that at speeds of we're, we're designed to run at a maximum speed, I mean, unless you're going super fast and you're world champion, our bodies are designed to protect us at our maximum running speed. 
And he says anything below 30 kilometers an hour, if we hit something, we can usually survive. Anything above that, uh, we're evolutionally not designed to do so. Which brings up the interesting point, right, on, on a bicycle, unless unless uh, you're, you're racing down a hill or uh, you're on one of those really fast e-bikes, it's likely that you'll be able to survive at normal urban traffic speeds. In terms of another physiological uh, attribute, it's uh, our ability to make eye contact, to able to uh, see movement and to predict movement and uh, predict interactions with other people. We can very easily do this on the sidewalk. We sidestep left or right according to uh, what other people are doing as they come towards us. The, the busy sidewalks of New York are an excellent example of this. Um, but as you ramp up the speed, we lose our ability to negotiate. And at what speed do we lose this ability? Uh, it, it's not clear, but it seems to me that uh, people cycling and seen in a uh, busy place like Amsterdam, they can self-manage quite well without traffic lights. So there's something about the speed at which we move under which we don't need regulation because we can self-regulate and interact with each other to make traffic movements happen. So this kind of brings us back to a very philosophical point, uh, and we covered this in uh, Coglin and Rye's uh, uh, paper about how modernism uh, and traffic engineering went together. And uh, Hamilton Bailey asked, how do we choose to balance the freedom of an individual to travel fast? And the well-being of other groups, such as children, the elderly, says a great deal about our values and the sorts of towns and cities that we desire. I ask you, what types of city do you desire? Uh, which environment could we use more of? And how can the cycling contribute to this environment? What aspects of... Uh, of traffic, of regulated uniform um, space that cycling require, and to what extent uh, does it make a cycling journey better to have a uh, more unpredictable, serendipitous journey? And uh, in relating to my own research, what does it mean for bicycle highways? And what kind of infrastructure are we creating if we're given the chance to create dedicated bi bicycle infrastructure? So these are my questions to you, and uh, it's been a while, but uh, but I'm back. So uh, <laughs> hello everyone, and I'm glad we finally got to episode 10 after a long summer break. Um, in the next episode, I'll talk about the future of this channel and how uh, we plan to proceed forward, especially at the Urban Cycling Institute. So stay tuned.